Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. I've done hundreds of them now, and if this is new to you and you'd like to check out previous ones, please go to batgap.com and look under the past interviews menu. Um, this program is made possible by the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. If you appreciate it and feel like supporting it in any amount, there's a PayPal button on every page of the site, and there's also a donate page that offers or explains other ways to donate. My guest today is Bonnie Greenwell. Um, I interviewed Bonnie several years ago and really enjoyed the conversation. In fact, I listened to that conversation this week and thought there was quite a bit in it. We really covered a lot of ground, so if, if those listening to this one find it interesting, you might want to check out the previous one as well. Um, Bonnie is a transpersonal psychotherapist and non-dual teacher in the lineage of Adya Shanti. After her Kundalini awakening in graduate school, she wrote a dissertation and book on the Kundalini process. In 2003, she met Adya and experienced a deep shift in consciousness that led to editing his book, Emptiness Dancing, which I think I have on the shelf right behind me, and an invitation to teach. She has worked as a mentor guide for people in Kundalini or Awakening processes for over 30 years. Her fourth book, When Spirit Leaps, there it is, um, <clears throat> Navigating the Process of Spiritual Awakening, was released last June. Bonnie was a founder and director of the Kundalini Research Network and has trained, <coughs> excuse me, and has, where was I? Yeah, and has trained people internationally to work with spiritual emergence and understand Kundalini phenomena. She believes the awakening of consciousness to truth is a natural realization available to all who sincerely long for self realization and that Kundalini is fundamentally a clearing and transformative energetic support for this process. She offers webinars and consultations on the web and can be contacted through her website and her Awakened Living blog, which I'll be linking to from her page on batgap.com. Um, I often, well, first of all, welcome, Bonnie. Thanks for doing this again. Thank you for inviting sure. me. Sure. Um, I've often referred people to you over the years who get in touch with some Kundalini situation, usually something that rather concerns them. And I've been in, I usually refer people either to you or to Joan Harrigan. Joan is kind of retiring from that now, so I guess it'll just be you. And also Lawrence Edwards is, is a good person to refer people to. I've interviewed him also. Oh. I've appreciated that, and I've enjoyed all the contact that I make. It's been a gift for me to uh, meet all the fascinating people who contact me over the years. Yeah, me too. I mean, it's kind of, we in, we move in interesting company when we do this sort of thing, don't we? <laughs> yeah, 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 it is. It's a, it's really lovely, isn't it? I mean, it, it's just uh, fun. You get to meet the most interesting people and hear the most amazing stories. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. Um, I don't know if we covered in, in your first interview the Kundalini awakening you had when you were in college or graduate school. Um, we want to, in case we didn't, would you want to just re explain that a little bit, what happened to you? Um, first of all, I went back to graduate school when I was about 40. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't just a college, a young college I student. Psychology, and at that time I had about 15 years of meditation that I had been doing meditation pretty steadily for a long time, and um, had done a lot of Jungian analysis, a lot of therapy. I was uh, licensed as a marriage and family counselor at the time, so I had a lot of background. And I went to ITP because at the time it had a lot of, um, it did a lot of body work as well as. Um, spiritual teachers would come through and speak and I was interested in those things and that I might as well get a doctorate for doing it. So uh, when I was there I um, went to a workshop with Gay Hendricks. Um, have you ever interviewed Gay? No, I, I remember he, uh, the name Gay was, and Bonnie uh, Hendricks I believe. It was. Uh, no, it's uh, uh, Catherine. Catherine. Uh, Catherine. Catherine, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, Gay was a doing something called radiance 
breath work at the time. Now with relationships, mm -hmm. but at that time he was doing radiance breath work, and I watched him working with someone else, and I immediately knew it had to do with spiritual awakening. It was the first time, even though I'd been in many uh, yogic systems and other places, in the strong connection between the body and spiritual awakening before. Mm -hmm. So I went to Gay and asked him to work with me and just told him I wanted to let go of any barrier to knowing God. And I worked with Gay, and after just one intense session, I uh, went back to class. I was sitting on the floor, an ITP in those days, was on the floor. And um, my energy just started rising. It just went up over and over. Extremely ecstatic from it. And uh, when the class was over, went up to the meditation room there and just sat for a couple of hours and kind of went into an altered space. And fortunately, I was in the people who were familiar with Kundalini fear about it. I, I knew what it was from watching gay work and from talking to other people there. I was also quite involved with Esalen and Stan Groff at the time. So I was just on the oral dissertation and decided to do my dissertation on Kundalini. And because the experience, it tended to Very, very wonderful. Just incredible bliss spontaneously. Um, walking down the street and feeling connected with everything. It was a really wonderful experience. And I got curious about the difference between, because I kept hearing from people who were having diff, had had difficulties with it. So I wrote a dissertation exploring what's the difference between someone who has a positive experience and with it. And research, and it led to uh, publishing my first book, publishing Kundalini Research Network with other people that I found that were involved and interested in the topic. Someone said they're having some problems with the sound. Your sound is breaking up a little bit, but I don't think there's anything we can do about that. It's a bandwidth thing. Um, but th no, don't worry about it. Nothing you can do. Um, okay, well, that's a good overview. Um, what kind of meditation had you been doing for 15 years? When I was young, I, I uh, had a, a Jungian analyst who was a follower of Yogananda. Mm -hmm. So I did, I used to sit with him. He did meditation in the morning of the week. And then I had a friend that was a psychologist that was a student. Mm -hmm. And so I also sat with him part of the time. Then I also got interested in uh, the three pillars of Zen. Pillars of Zen, and so I was also exploring that. Um, before that, um, I had been involved with an organization called Creative Initiative Foundation, and that was my first exposure to the idea of meditation and to even also to Jungian psychology. And when I left that organization, I just had this incredible longing um, to make a connection, a deeper connection. And that drove me into the sitting for hours, I get my children off to school, and I would spend many hours a day just sitting. Um, different approaches and did different practices at different times. This brings up an interesting question, which I wasn't going to ask until later, but it kind of relates, I think, to what you're saying. Um, someone named Clarice from Freehold, New Jersey, um, asked, is awakening predetermined? Some teachers seem to avoid answering this question because they don't want people to lose the motivation to practice. This, and, I, and she also adds this is perhaps related to the topic of free will. And the reason I think it's relevant to what you were just saying is that you know, some people just seem to come into this life with um, the seeds of a very strong, ardent desire for awakening and enlightenment and so on, and, and it just consumes them, and, and they pursue it, and very often get results. Um, and, you know, others just aren't interested. And, you know, texts such as the Bhagavad Gita talk about how, you know, we might have done spiritual practice in a previous life, and then come into this life, and you know, be born into circumstances that will be conducive to continuing our, our path. Um, 
So do you have any comments or thoughts about whether it's predetermined? And I know we're going to talk a lot about the significance of practice. I, I don't think even if you think it's predetermined that you would say that don't bother doing anything and, uh, and it'll happen if it's meant to happen. I don't think we can know if it's predetermined. That would just be an opinion or a belief system. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's potential for awakening is built into every human, but the longing for it varies greatly, and that many people are just so distracted by other um, goals and intentions and and uh, challenges in their lives that they're just never drawn to those kinds of existential questions that draw meditators. Uh, so I feel that that anybody who has a deep longing, I think that's kind of the primary uh, primary dynamic that supports awakening is the and a persistence with that, and that um, in a way you could say that that's what that which is longing mm -hmm. is the pure consciousness, and it's simply meeting that call. On the other hand, I've met many people with awakenings who weren't intending it at all. And in those cases, it might indeed be predetermined or it might, very often it appears possible that it was a previous life and they were obviously going to wake up in this life whether they expected it or intended it or not. So it can happen both ways. There's many different events and that can happen that cause a sudden, at least a glimpse mm -hmm. of truth. It doesn't mean they wake up and they stay awake and enlighten suddenly. It just means they have glimpses. They're being called yeah. by waking in a way. When you use phrases like wake up or stay awake or so on, it, it kind of sounds black and white, on and off. You know, it's like either you're awake or you're not. And um, I mean, if we take the example of sleep at night, um, you know, obviously there is a transition period between waking and sleeping where we're sort of trying to wake up but we're not all the way there yet. Um, and then obviously a little bit later and when we're into our day, we're, we would say we're totally awake as compared to what we were when we're asleep. So do you think that's a, a, a reasonable metaphor for um, spiritual awakening as well? That it's, uh, th there could be, f you know, kind of deep darkness where it's there's hardly any glimpse of it and there could be very clear realization of it but there could also be a, uh, a middle ground um, which is sort of foggy but still some degree of it? I, I think a, a better metaphor would be uh, somebody that has to wake up every night and get up and then goes back to sleep again. I think that what happens for most people so there's an initial and it, what I call an event um, in which suddenly they everything falls away and they're just standing there in their pure connection with everything or a very uh, clear uh, sense of I don't exist. Uh, I'm not. It's not. I'm not what I thought I was. But then the old uh, psychological patterns and the old identities come back. Again. I. I believe that for most people, there's a kind of a moving back and forth between the sense of freedom and openness and expansion and then the sense of contraction and being entangled in some old emotional issue or dynamic. That's why I think of the energetics of the as being a clearing process because it it feels like the energy supports that clearing that has to happen, that letting go of, you know, I thought I was really free and now this has come up, so clearly I'm not free anymore. And people get very upset about that, but the sense, the awakeness is always there. It's just that all these other preoccupations and distractions and you could say your, your dharma arrives in your life that belong to you, they arise, they have to be met, they have to be understood or, or released, um, accepted in some way, in some new way, so that light of 
pure consciousness has more to shine through. Yeah. So and it goes on. I think for most of our lives, for most people, it doesn't, it, it's not a permanent state for most people, uh, at least not. In fact, um, Aja once told me that the Buddhists say that after an awakening, uh, you should allow about 12 years uh, for it to mature or become more stable. And that's if you stay committed to your practice. You're not just uh, saying, oh, I'm done, and you wander off into other other distractions. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's dwell on this a bit more in terms of definition of awakening and versus enlightenment and so on. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, I hear Adya himself saying that even in his own experience, uh, there's a continuing growth. Um, and, uh, you know, pre and who knows if or when it ever ends. Um, and some people, you know, would take exception to that, and they would say, well, you know, that, to, that which awakens doesn't change, and so how can it grow? Um, and uh, what would be your answer to that? Well, the awakeness doesn't change. I mean, the awakeness is, is there, but it, as I said, it gets kind of clouded over by our personal and attachments and challenges and and uh, so you could think of it more that the sky never changes the sky is always there but sometimes it's full of clouds sometimes it's full of of uh, darkness and shadows and sometimes it's just bright sunlight so the the ground of being isn't going to change but your ability to be in touch and move from that it's going to vary greatly depending on many different uh, circumstances. Yeah, that's a good answer. Um, I mean, we could obviously, we could even say that a rock has the same ground of being that we do, uh, but the rock has some room for growth in terms of being a f conscious, functioning being of some sort. <laughs> uh, and by the same token, you know, we have room for growth. Perhaps we're better off than the rock, but uh, doesn't mean we've, we or anyone has reached the sort of ultimate possibility of, of embodiment, embodying pure consciousness. Sure. The, um, the human that we are um, is gets attached to our, our, we're designed in bodies to function as human beings with one another in separation. So when consciousness wakes itself up, uh, the human characteristics that we have that's just programmed into us to be human beings is very alarmed by letting itself fall away. So there's, there's a, uh, a struggle between the, the character me and first feels very unknown, very much not me that's coming up through us and trying to take over our lives. So there's a sense of struggle for most people for a long time. Let go and, and let insights and wisdom and potentiality of their true nature to come through. Mm -hmm. It's just natural. It's just natural because we've, we've been built as a physiological system in such a way. That we believe we're... And often the people that are going through this have spent many years improving their self-image or their uh, abilities to function in the world. You know, they've individuated. And uh, it's like you have the feeling, of, I'm going to lose all of that. It's all, it's all been for nothing. But the whole way I've been living my life was wrong. And, and you get into these struggles. And, and that there's room for growth. It's, it's there's room for more and would you say that that's true of everyone, that there's a struggle and a feeling that you're losing your ability to function, or is that just one of a, a number of varieties of experience that can come up? There's some kind of a of dynamic between uh, the old established personal self and the nature, which has a very different sense of identity. Uh, that can vary greatly. It, 
for example, somebody that's been in a very long-term spiritual practice, and this is what they've been looking for a long time, is, is this uh, awakeness or awareness they experience, um, they're, then they have a context for it. Um, they might uh, more easily let go who had a near-death experience uh, or was in an activated and uh, they were doing something you know they were one woman for example was a dentist and she, uh, activated her energy through some shamanic workshop she went through and very hard if you're very scientifically oriented and all of a sudden you're seeing things very differently so it, it varies greatly from one person to another how they meet as they arise yeah but i guess just to summarize the the general point you're making here is that awakening um entails a, a real transformation of the vehicle through which awakening is experienced or anything is experienced uh, namely the the mind the nervous system the personality um you can't pour new wine into old wineskins that you're going to have to get a new wineskin or transform the old one into a new one. <laughs> I think that's what Jesus was alluding to when he said that. Yeah, yeah. I think that's true. It, it's, that's what the energy process does. The, we have 72,000 lines of energy flow in our body. And uh, I feel that we are energy fields. In fact, I saw a quote by Einstein the other day where he said, everything is energy. If you could move as, at the come in. In it. Um, so we're energy fields and everything that's ever happened to us in this life and maybe even previous lives is, is woven into our energy field. So when Kundalini arises, its function is that clearing out of those old knots and patterns and uh, belief systems and assumptions and created in our energy field and our consciousness because of our past experiences. Yeah, that's an interesting quote by Einstein. Um, you know, it takes, what, about two million years for light to get to us from the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, but if you were a photon, if you could imagine a photon having a perspective, uh, the photon arrives instantly. So for a photon, there's no distance. Um, the photon, you could say, is infinite as Einstein said it's 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 omnipresent it's it's everywhere instantly um, and I think there's a kind of corollary between that and the way consciousness is described yeah, yeah. Um, okay so in in your book you mentioned at some point that you know some spiritual people or traditions perhaps Advaita or maybe new Advaita people um, kind of dismiss the whole energy thing as kind of an illusory consideration that we shouldn't bother dwelling on. Um, you know, we're just kind of getting ourselves caught up in, in unnecessary complexities or something if we give much attention to it. Um, and you address that question or doubt in your book, so I'll, I'll let you do so here. You know, one of the reasons I've written this book and all my this last one is that so many of the people who contact me have a traditional spiritual system and often uh, if they raise energy or they have unusual uh, phenomena going on in their meditation centers they're told that it's wrong or it's dangerous or they shouldn't uh, be coming to sittings anymore because they're disturbing people and um, they're not being uh, given the kind of support and guidance that and this is true not only for uh, therapists who often misdiagnose um, a spiritual awakening, but it's, it's true for yoga teachers, it's true for Buddhist meditation teachers, it's true for uh, even energy workers when people go into transcendent states or particularly energetic activities. Sometimes they make sounds, 
Sometimes their body is doing strange things all night and they get frightened. They don't have anyone to talk to because their teachers don't understand the process. Unless you have a teacher that's really gone through the whole process themselves, and many have not, they're not going to have an understanding of it. And the advantage of who does understand it is that I've seen many different systems, people coming out of many different systems with many different kinds of phenomena, where most teachers who teach about Kundalini are well, this is how it's supposed to be, this is what it looks like. One teacher wrote to inquiring about his difficulties, wrote back and said, this can't be Kundalini because Kundalini is always positive. So, Where's he been living? <laughs> you know, it, it, it just, yeah, people. Yeah. It, just, it just really, uh, uh, so many people have written me and said when they found my book, they wish they had found it 10 years earlier because they had struggled a long time. Uh, they what the energy was, they didn't know how to manage it, they were afraid they were going crazy, and they didn't know how to bring it. What I found is stuck in the energetic process, they don't know about waking up. They don't know what it means, in a sense, to wake up, to recognize your true nature, and so if they can continue to move in once that shift happens, the energy is much calmer, much easier to live with. Uh, and what's been important to me, uh, what I've learned and been so grateful for, is I started out with the yogic model. And I spent some time in India, and I did a lot of the classical way of looking at Kundalini. Yoga, it's, it's uh, definitely a... Uh, model that uses the energy body to bring one into an awakened state, to bring energy up, wake up. And when I was in that model, I didn't know that it would have an awakening without the energy. But when I started sitting with Ajashanti, I started seeing people have awakenings, having these great shifts of consciousness. Uh, but afterwards, their energy would start to been really blessed in seeing that that it can happen from both uh, in both ways. Unfortunately, uh, sometimes in Advaita or Buddhist systems, uh, there's not a recognition of the energy, and in the energy systems, the awakening can happen first. And I to be able to see both sides of that picture. Yeah. Pull any one leg of the table, and all the other legs will come along. <laughs> Um, one thing I appreciate about your books um, and your whole perspective is that it's so kind of um, all-encompassing. You, you know, you're open to all possibilities uh, as having relevance to um, the awakening process. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, which I think I also consider that my perspective because I have to if I'm doing a show like this. I'm talking to such a variety of people. And uh, and I hear week after week, you know, significant you know, stories of very significant shifts and awakenings and so on through such a variety of means. And you know, I kind of if I had to summarize it, I would just say that you know, God is not a one-trick pony. I mean, the 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 diversity of creation that we see in in a rainforest or in, in the world in general is paralleled by the diversity of spiritual paths or, or means through which um, or varieties of experience which people can have as, as they awaken. That's true. That's the advantage of like yourself or like me uh, who gets to because we get to hear stories that obviously come from so many different uh, practices encounters with life um, so you can see the broad range of ways form yeah. and that awakening can happen I was talking to a gentleman last weekend and he had gotten some flack from religious fundamentalists at a certain stage of his path and uh, you know, I had reminded him that there are some 40 billion earth-like planets in our galaxy by most estimates and they're saying these days about 
perhaps 10 trillion galaxies in the known universe. And if, if even 1% of those Earth-like planets, and who's to say they have to be Earth-like, have some kind of intelligent life on them that has you know, begun to tune into the, the spiritual dimension, just think how many <laughs> varieties of, of spiritual experience there are in the universe and, it, and how absurd it is for any, anyone to be rigidly insistent that theirs is the best or the only way. <clears throat> I think a lot of times, uh, particularly fundamentalist systems, um, if uh, participants uh, wake up, uh, they're not, it, the, the whole idea of somebody having experience of the sacred or of God or of the universe is uh, threatening to the hierarchical structures because you you don't believe anymore it's not about believing it's about experience and uh, in many systems you're really not supposed to do that you're supposed to go on faith in the system that you and in the particular minister or priest that is the head of that system yeah. uh, and so it's very hard for in a, in a real uh, fundamentalist system and often they get advice being told it must be of the devil or it must be uh, dangerous or they sound crazy or you know and, and um, it it can be very damaging yeah. um, so it's it's very important I think what you're doing is very important I refer people to you all the time too <laughs> and um, that people what I'm hoping you know I'm I'm getting old I'm wanting to get this material out there and in the hands of ministers and various people who are in a role where they can tell somebody just give someone a book or tell them perhaps this is what's happening to you instead of frightening them to death yeah it's great you're doing that um, because as I see it the the sort of pace of awakening and the and the sort of a frequency uh, of it, and the, the commonality of it, the pop the, in the world is increasing. There's something in the field you know, that's getting enlivened, and more and more people are waking up. And as you say, in many cases, they don't know what it is, or they get flack from their religious leaders, and so on. So I think it's it's really something that's going to have to become more common knowledge and is becoming more common um, as we go along over the over the coming years. Fortunately, as it becomes more common knowledge, there's also quite a bit of distortion yeah. on the web. So that is people need to be cautious. People need to find their own intuitive knowing about what's right for them and uh, really develop that that capacity for discrimination along with the trust in their own energy and their own experiences. Um, a lot of, there's a lot of distortion that are presented to people and, and uh, you can get stuck in on the wrong direction for a while. Uh, also, before you get off that, you point, know, if you if uh, want to change points, yeah. I just want to say, I've been thinking about that as I was reading your book and about the importance of both knowledge and experience. It's like they're, t they're, they're like the two legs through which we walk on the spiritual path, and you can't really walk on one leg. And so experience without knowledge can result in all kinds of fear and confusion and misunderstanding and, you know, taking Thorazine or something because you think you're going crazy. And knowledge without experience can become fanatical and pedantic and dry, and one can mistake mere knowledge for the actual experience to which it refers. So I think it's really an important safeguard and a necessity on the spiritual path to be simultaneously culturing both in a genuine way. I feel like the, one of the, my prime um, intentions is to create a context so that you have a, a context for the uh, kinds of phenomena that's arising, which in my own opinion is that this is um, an opportunity for human transformation. It's happening to you because you've been invited to um, for your consciousness to wake up and live in a new way in the world. And it 
can be thought of as a uh, but it doesn't have to be. It can be thought of as a uh, human potential transformative experience of being more of being. And two people may have the very same experience and interpret it in both those different ways. You know, um, it's like we all, you know, we look at a painting or we listen to some music and we all have very different interpretations of it, yet it's the same painting, same music, same sunset we're looking at. Um, right. Yeah. yeah, it touches us in different ways. Uh -huh. It calls us, I think, to a new expression in the world. If we, if we stay with it, if we embody what we've seen, what we've felt, it calls us to uh, find a way of expressing it in what from our deepest core feels uh, necessary to come through us. Uh, happened to you, and that's why you're doing the work you do. Some something called you. <laughs> Actually, in a way, Adya called me. I mean, I've been I've been doing this stuff for you know my own spiritual practice for and pursuit for decades. But I was out in the garage listening uh, listening to Adya Shanti while working out on a Bowflex machine, and the idea popped into my head to do an interview show, and then that idea wouldn't leave me alone and. Initially, I thought of it as a local radio show and this little station we have here, but that, that wasn't really going to happen. And, and then finally we got it started and put it on the internet. One thing led to the next. But I've always felt like there's a, a real nice wind at my back in, in doing this project. It's something that's needed and something that's supported. That's a, such a good point because uh, a lot of times people who have had an awakening established, they want to know what to do. And, uh, you know, when we're younger, or before you would say we're driven by the intellect or the mind or the intention, you know, we have goals in life and we're going after those goals. But uh, it doesn't work that way after an awakening. It works as a spontaneous To me, after my Kundalini awakening, um, out of some, I wrote, I took, wrote my dissertation, there was nothing else I could have written about. I was so full of this energy. And with the thought that if only one person gets some use out of this, it's worth my time. And then somehow the Kundalini Research Network evolved and uh, it was like, it happened through me. I managed it for several years, effortless. It was just happening and it, it it really was not something I decided in my head I'm going to do this it was like just came through it's like okay bring people together that have had the and I think people need to understand that if the to do it has to do with listening really intuitively dropping in and and waiting for that in, inspiration and if it's the right thing for kind of bubbling, it'll keep coming up until you lean into it a little bit and see if it's it's what you're meant to do. Yeah. And you were talking a little earlier about discrimination um, and discernment. Um, you know, I think some people can swing too far in the other direction where they, they're just sort of following their impulses because they feel like that's the way the universe is guiding me. But you can end up indulging in whims. You know, you can quit a good job or quit a good relationship or something just because you have some kind of impulse. <laughs> it all needs to be tempered and, and kind of counterbalanced with other factors and, and, and so on. I think that's true. Um, you have to learn the difference between the ego's impulses and the deeper uh, potentialities. Uh, usually I tell people if something keeps coming up, or, you know, repeats itself, maybe it belongs to you. Lean in a bit. Attach to the results. See what happens and if it's meant for you if it's the right thing it'll unfold in just the right way if it's not comfortable you won't be happy pretty quickly and you'll know uh, no this isn't going to work for me or this was just temporary I don't know why but even with the Kundalini and that that energy ran out for me and it was just over for me and um, and when I left that organization within a few weeks or months, I met Ajit. Mm. 
a whole new door. Uh, and then I uh, helped him with some, well, with emptiness dancing. I decided to create emptiness dancing. That was another. And for a long time, I thought, well, I don't. I can do this. It sounds like I'm just trying to get attention or something. I didn't know if it was an egoic impulse or not, but it kept coming up. So finally, I just went to him and said, we had all these talks that had been uh, written, that uh, transcribed from his lectures, from his songs, and they were just sitting in the fire. I said, I'd really like to take some of your talks and put them into a book. I think it would be helpful for the organization. People would find you. That, And uh, he said, okay. <laughs> so I did that. Yeah. So that just opened me up to a whole other world, really. Um, and so that came, but it came from following something that was kind of just pulling it. Yeah. About that. Yeah, it's very interesting. You, you, it takes a while to get the, the sense of how it is to fall into that part of yourself. Um, but you can, it, it happens eventually for people that, are, that stay in this process. It does. There's a saying in Sanskrit, I don't remember the Sanskrit, but the English of it is, Brahman is the charioteer. And, and I think what it means is that, you know, well, you can think of a chariot or you can think of a car. And initially, you know, we're, we feel like we're driving it. You know, we're in the driver's seat. We're in control. But there's, you were talking earlier about this transition one must undergo. And the transition entails, among other things, a shift from who's in control, uh, of, of who's in control. And eventually Brahman is found to be the charioteer, the, the, the wholeness, the cosmic intelligence or whatever is. is and we're just going, going along for the ride. But but it's That's but it's tricky as as the transition is underway, and it can take decades, you know, in process because there can be this sort of gray area where it's like, you know, wh wh whose impulse is this? Is this my ego? Is this is this something that's meant to be in some deeper yeah. sense? And 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 there's kind of a constant discernment that has to sort of work be, be worked out in order to. Well, you, yeah. know, you can't surrender too much to the point of passivity and indecision, but you don't want to be sort of egotistically dominant in terms of forcing it, you know, my way or the highway. There, there's kind of a balancing thing that, that happens over time. <laughs> well, what, what often happens is if you're, if you're moving in a for you, you feel crappy. Yeah. You don't feel well. You, you have all kinds of barriers come up, and you're not, you're both interior and exterior. Most of us, you know, we're raised to believe we should fight through everything, but uh, instead we need to actually listen. What's the message here? Is this the right place for me? Is it? Is it um, I'm feeling dead in my work now. Do I need to really listen? And we need to learn silence, as Ajashanti likes to point out, and do, uh, wait and be patient because this is kind of a, a new um, that wants to be heard. But unless we go into the silence and the stillness and, and spend some time inviting it, um, it's going to show up. It's not going to show up as a True nature doesn't push through. It doesn't push through our egoic stuff. We have to kind of meet it. Mm. Um, to we have to get in a cooperative relationship with it. Yeah, that we're. There's some quote that when you said that kind of came to mind. I don't remember. There's some some scriptural thing either from the Bible or some Vedic thing about how. Uh, maybe you can remember it, but how. You know, the divine is not pushy. It's not going to sort of beat down the door and insist that it be welcomed in. It's going to sort of need to be invited. And there needs to be a sort of a, well, a surrender, really, from our side, a, a, co a cooperativeness. And it's not going to force us to do that. Uh, that's true. I've heard Ajashanti say that, yeah. too. He just talked. It's... Um... It's that's why the the meditation and the sitting in stillness and the resting is so important yeah. after an awakening. Marshi once used the analogy of um, 
you know, going in for surgery. You know, surgeon can't operate until you're willing to lie still and, and be, be willing to undergo the process. That's right. You know, it helps if you uh, begin to see that you never had any control anyway, that that was an illusion all along. If you, if you look back at your life, you'll see most of the major events in it you didn't control. The person you're married to, you didn't say, I'm such and such, it's just like this, and, and you had control. I met my husband in a parking lot, you know, I mean... It wasn't controlled at all. And uh, your children, when, when you have your children evolve, you have very little control. You have a lot of influence uh, emotionally and psychologically. But most of us would say our children have moved into directions that we didn't, didn't foresee for them. Uh, at least that's been my experience. Um, and I know my mother was a very devout Catholic. She would be quite shocked to see what I'm <laughs> So it's not, uh, we, what we, think we do. We have the ability to respond, to accept. We appear to have that ability, although it's probably based on our conditioning. But uh, our life had many, many of the most amazing things that have happened because you were in control of it. Yeah. Interesting that we're dwelling on this topic as much as we are, but I just rem reminded of you know, so many instances in which parents demand that their child be a lawyer or something like that, you know, which is completely opposite to what they want to be. Um, like, you know, Dead Poets Society, that was one of the themes of that movie. Um, and uh, in my case, I wanted, from the age of four, I wanted to play the drums, and my parents kept saying I should learn to play the piano first. And I hated playing the piano. <laughs> so that went on for 10 years until I finally got a drum set. Um, and then I took right off with it. So it's, it's sort of, I don't know, obviously kids need guidance, but there's, there's something about letting, um, there's this verse in the Gita, it said, creatures act according to their own nature. What can restraint accomplish? Yeah. You know, that's an issue for a lot of people who have awakenings, is that they're in a career that they chose, or they're maybe they're college students. One young man I'm thinking of was a, an economics major in college, and he had a terrible automobile accident, and it activated his energy. Uh, he just didn't want to study economics anymore. And many people are taken uh, because somebody directed them to that and said that that would be the wisest thing to do because they'd make more money Plastic. or because their family, all their family does it, their family. <laughs> um, you remember that line from The Graduate? You know, Dustin Hoffman's trying to figure out what he's going to do and the guy says, plastics. <laughs> well, if that's been your story, if this, your story has been you've been in the wrong field uh, or you're the group of people that feel really toxic, you won't be able to stay in that. Eventually, you're going to have to listen to your gut about what do you really want to express and how what would feel congruent and authentic. And you're going to have to make some changes, yeah. or you won't be happy. I mean, you don't have to make the changes, but if you want to be content and free, you may have to make some serious changes. I'm going to segue here back to something we were talking about earlier. I uh, just want to dwell on that a little bit more and then go through some other points. Um, we were talking about awakening. And you said, as, we, as you were talking about that, that um, it's kind of unusual for a kind of permanent shift to take place. That there's this sort of, I got it, I lost it thing. And you kind of implied that, that that's going to be the norm for most people. But you want to correct that before I go on, if, if that's not what you meant to say? All I can say about it is that it takes time for uh, the, the pure consciousness to be more consistently uh, dominant. One way I it's like here's this the little self, the me, the, the person, the character you've been pretending to be all your life with all your and abilities and accomplishments and problems. And here's the pure consciousness. 
And all of a sudden, wham, you, this is a, and then this comes up. It may take an hour, it may take a week, it may take a few months, it's about the longest this ever stays. And then this comes up again. And then you're going like this. Mm-hmm. And and eventually, if you stay committed, surrendering, facing your stuff, your psychological comes up, um, getting your life kind of oriented in a way that feels more authentic, becomes more and more present. And eventually, this is more dominant, but this might pop up once in a while. But that's how it, mm-hmm. that's how it seems. Among all the, I've talked with thousands of people, and of course, the, if there are people who just have one simple awakening and they're completely free the rest of their life, call me. Yeah. So. More power to them. This people that I work with. Yeah, I think one thing that people might find helpful is, and I think most people understand this, is that you can have a really profound experience. Let's say you're in meditation and you have this transcendent, blissful, unbounded experience you know you feel like you're omnipresent or something um, and every experience uh, of that nature tends to fade and many things tend to integrate through repeated exposure to them and as they integrate they become the norm and so you don't really notice you know you might not even think about it you could actually be in quite an unbounded awareness and driving your car and talking to your wife or doing whatever you're doing, but it's just kind of the natural state, and it's not something one reflects upon or remarks upon. You know, upon. So it's like, you know, the contrast when something initially happens can be quite notable, but enlightenment is not a contrasting experience. It's not a flashy experience. It's it's more of a natural state which um, becomes as comfortable as breathing or something. What I feel it is is a, it's a it's a different way of perceiving the world, and the perception is different. It's more holistic. It's more in the moment, in present in the moment. It's more intuitive. Um, it's more just being present with what is and non-resistant to what is. Um, those are some of the qualities that I feel. Uh, and it, as that becomes more the norm in how you function, and your, I think the thing that really falls away is the uh, what Freud called the super, the part of your mind that's always telling you maybe you've made a mistake or something's wrong or what's wrong with that person. That that collapses. It doesn't have any. So it's there's much more. Clarity when you're people or you're reading or you're listening or you're it's just it's just being present with what is and responding in a way that feels authentic that feels it's coming kind of from the heart or the gut rather than um, the mind mind has stored all that information that you've picked up over the years like you've. But um, it just kind of comes up. You don't have to work to think about what you're going to say. Yeah. I know the way Eckhart Tolle operates, he, say, he says that he never prepares for his talks or anything. He just gets up on stage, gets in the car, goes to the place, gets on the stage, sits down, and, and something starts coming out of his mouth. Um, on the other hand, I know when Adya prepares a course, he, he does a lot of research and um, you know he has books around his house with little tabs in them where he's taking notes of things and all that stuff. So I don't, I don't think the two are incompatible. I think that, and obviously if you were, let's say, an awakened person studying to be a doctor, you're not just going to wing it. When you, you're, you're, you have to do all kinds of study and learning and memorization and, and everything to, to be a, an effective doctor or airline pilot or anything else. There's no incompatibility there. Well, what I have found, uh, it's been interesting. I've known Aja now for maybe 18 years. And I would say that for many years, everything he taught was spontaneous. Song. He may have had an idea of a theme right. when he came in, 
fairly spontaneous yeah. expression. And I think what happened, and I'm projecting here because I haven't ever asked him, but I think that he began to meet so many students, thousands of students from all over the world. Uh, he became much more um, interested in looking at the cross-referencing of all the and I think that after a while, in a, uh, at first, it's, it's everything feels really spontaneous. But and the mind, many people will say their mind is sharp. You can't, you can't really learn academically for a while. You don't. It feels uncomfortable. You can do it. I found for myself, I, I was in graduate school, and I couldn't teach from a program anymore. I just I just hated it. I had to just teach spontaneously. And so I quit teaching graduate school. But um, I, yeah, I believe that after I, what I have seen is that I think after a certain period of time, the mind becomes much more clear and crisp in a way. And so you can go back to absorbing information, at least if it's meaningful to your um, your spiritual work. Yeah. Maybe for other things too. Maybe you become more brilliant. Maybe I Einstein was awake and he got his brilliant ideas from that. I, I don't know. Uh, I've I've seen Aja evolve yes. in that way, yeah. and in the kind of programs he teaches. His interest in bringing in many, many of the rich resources here in the world. I may interview him again in a week or so. If I do, I will ask him that because I think it's an interesting point. Um, okay, so just to put a cap on it then, um, do you feel... I mean, I, I hesitate to use the term enlightenment because it has such a kind of superlative, static connotation, like it's some kind of pot at the, of gold at the end of the rainbow kind of thing. Um, I mean, do, do you feel that there is some state that humans achieve uh, or have achieved which is worthy of a term with such connotations, um, or do you feel like even the most enlightened beings to ever walk the planet were probably still st still probably had a, you know a horizon before them which they could explore or do you feel that that's just something that you, you can't none of us can really speculate on until we get there it's <laughs> um, a good question is everybody has a different story about what it means that's the problem and so it, if you it say shouldn't be that way i mean there must be something that that term relates to in human experience, uh, and as as is the case with most words, I mean, we shouldn't all have a, an opinion as to what 55 miles an hour means. Uh, <laughs> there's some kind of, you know, it means something that we have to abide by. So it would be nice if words correspond to to actual realities and we agree upon their meaning. Well, I think it's easier just to say what you mean by it, and then uh, then See if you others can agree. Yeah. But if gets in because some people will say oh it means you can walk through walls it means you can translocate sure, like yeah. Ram said to do, uh, somebody to be their, their teacher the teachers some of them in the classical tradition will say oh there's you can't possibly become enlightened in this life you're not ready um, or they say um, they take up some like you mentioned the other day or sometime of a teacher you interviewed who said he never sleeps. Some will say you never dream. So, you know, people will say, well, gee, that's not true for me. So I'm a long way from yeah. trans uh, bilocate and uh, I still have dreams occasionally. So I like to think of enlightenment more as uh, being present in the world that feels very free very open, very uh, coming from uh, love comes through sometimes spontaneously for no reason at all. Um, very much to uh, having particular results, not less react, not reactive, um, wanting to be of service, um, and some of the other qualities that we've talked about. Um, 
people don't become enlightened. Enlightenment arises, uh, just becomes more present. I uh, don't believe in individual. Most people will not tell you they're enlightened. They won't use that phrase. It's not the personal little me that talks doesn't feel like that's even possible. Uh, You can always find a dozen reasons why you're not enlightened. Uh, But consciousness can come through at at times and be very, very very beautiful. And uh, for some people, that happens more consistently, permanently for some. Um, I think the other thing that people get confused about, and wonderful for me with my friendship with Adya and and, uh, Mukti, too, and others is that they're willing to be normally normal humans. Sure. Yeah. They're willing to they're not pretending to be on a on a some elevated level that uh, normal people can't relate to. I was in the took a package in for the Sangha and the, the postmaster saw the name on the package and said, um, oh uh, Steve, he's <laughs> You know, so it's just like he knows how to be, how to be ordinary. Yeah. And even though he's not just ordinary, he's he's got a, a perspective and a capacity to bring that the average person doesn't have. Yeah, I think that's one reason Audrey is, Audrey is so popular with a certain... Um, it's real. Yeah. And it's a safety factor also for him and for students because I, I, I know of a number of teachers who get into this specialness thing and it gets more and more inflated and they end up, you know, creating a weird scene around them. Students have a weird relationship with them. They ended up, end up crashing and burning in some way because pride goeth before a fall. And um, so I think it's a safeguard for both the teacher and the students, his students or her students to keep it grounded, you know, keep it real. I think uh, it's very important. I don't think, I think anybody that's truly free, and maybe we can talk about it more as freedom or liberation than enlightenment. Anybody that's truly free does not need to be worshipped by anyone, doesn't even want to be worshipped, doesn't want to be considered special. And Instead, they're likely to look at everyone else as having the same source and the same potential. Uh, and um, they're, um, they're not likely to put themselves on a pedestal or have people throw flowers at them and all of that. <laughs> that's, kind of, that's kind of the old, the old ancient classic way of honoring your guru kind of thing and it's just not uh, maybe it was useful at one point in time because what you were doing was honoring the and it was devotional but it's not relevant today yeah. it's not helpful with the kinds of today yeah i would temper that statement a little bit it's a little bit um um unnuanced uh, you know i would say that it, Firstly, this whole devotional thing has is somewhat of a cultural thing. It's it's more normal in India than here, for instance. But secondly, I would say that even here, there are people for whom it's still relevant. I mean, you go to Siama, for instance, and the scene around her is rather is quite devotional. Although the first thing she does when she comes in the hall is bow her head to the floor to everyone else. <laughs> um, so I don't know. I I'm just careful not to make blanket statements. Um, and. That I agree there. Uh, age of spiritual evolving, uh, very powerful devotion is very helpful. Yeah. And uh, this is true in Christianity, devotion to Mary or Jesus or a saint. Uh, in India, many people choose a special being that you choose, that you throw all your devotion to. And it's very important because it opens the heart. And if you've had that... Uh, channel opened in your life and you wake up, you're much more able to move from an embodied awakening. So almost some 
uh, approach to opening the heart. So, uh, yeah, I don't, I certainly went through a very strong self mm-hmm. with uh, Yogananda, and uh, I've seen it in many other people. I, I think emotion takes you all the way to realization, but I think it, it prepares the, uh, it opens the channel. Yeah. Embodiment. Right. Yeah, there's an age-old debate about that between the sort of the the Vaishnavites and the and the Advaitins about whether um, you know devotion and maintaining some separation between you and God is a state you'd want to perpetually be in for the bliss of that relationship, or whether you'd want to sort of go for full merger and union. And um, as, as some teachers have put it, it's not really none of your business at this stage. Decide that when you get there. <laughs> you know? it's, not, it's not something to argue about. Um, so, okay, so we were talking earlier about the, the relevance of awakening, uh, of energy to awakening, and, and you were saying how, you know, some teachers sort of dismiss it or cons- don't consider it terribly relevant or don't know anything about it. And you know, others would consider it instrumental, and I think you would be one of those who would say that it's definitely something that needs to be understood and dealt with because it's going to happen to so many people. Um, but here's a question that kind of extends that a little bit, and that is that is uh, is is a Kundalini awakening or opening, um, even even if it comes to some completion, if there is such a thing, uh, uh, is that sufficient for true enlightenment? Or does one need some teacher or other influence to fully come to rest, even after Kundalini has fully awakened? Well, that's a challenging question. Uh, there may be people who have had uh, all on their own a complete realization of truth through a Kundalini activation mm-hmm. who don't uh, have never had a teacher. Uh, those, those don't tend to be the people that call me, so I can't say that I've met a lot of people like that. Um, Let me rephrase the question slightly before you go on, and that is that um, is full awakening of Kundalini um, tantamount to or correla- perfectly correlated with full development of consciousness or enlightenment, or is, there, is it just sort of one stage of it and there, there might be something more that needs to be done after that? Or needs needs to happen. I believe it's the stage. Mm-hmm. It's the it's the inner part for um, enlightenment or liberation. But um, usually in the system, specifically, the goal seems to be samadhi, mm-hmm. and samadhi samadhi is is a, a great sense of consciousness merged with universal simplify it by saying that that's not quite enough um, that's if people can go into samadhi and samadhi, they just spend all their time laying down or leaning against a wall and cave and disappearing uh, there's a need for a return and to bring the energy back down below the neck and to um, uh, begin to, and sometimes there's a great need to clear out your old psychological stuff. If you have unfinished psychological business, you've never worked on it, everything is going to come up eventually. So you have to, sometimes people that are capable of going into samadhi states or satori, and they, because they feel free and escaped out of their body and their life, the next step is to come back into your life, uh, to be awakened life. And um, that sometimes you need some guidance. You need a context. You need, you don't have your next, your parents aren't going to help because they, they're, they're your time detached. So you need some, some place, a community or uh, some kind of guidance to get a context of, uh, how do I be alive and have, how do I live it? How do I connect with whatever this wants of me to the world uh, and to do it in a, 
a way that is it's going to be unique to you but useful to have some kind of a guide it might be a teacher it might be um, a community that is working this together in a way supporting one another um, you know might be a, a good friend on there with you I, I can't say I wouldn't say that no one can teach because that just makes no sense um, but it's probably rare for somebody with no guidance. I just want to say one thing about samadhi. I'm, there's a number of different kinds of samadhi, different terms for different stages or, or degrees of samadhi, and I, I'm, I don't claim to be an expert, but I believe it's nirvikalpa samadhi, isn't it? Which is supposed to mean without break, so that it's, it's, it's an integrated state which one can live in the midst of dynamic activity and yet there's a sort of continuum of pure awareness regardless of the circumstances or what challenges you may be confronting. I think that would be comparable to uh, living from an awakened or enlightened. Yeah. Uh, it's not as dramatic as the kind of samadhi where you're kind of out of your body. Well, it's integrated. Not... Yeah, I mean when, when Ramana first yeah, when Ramana first woke up, he went into deep samadhi in, in that pit, in that temple, and insects were chewing his leg, and he was oblivious to that and all. But later on, after years in a cave and, and integration, he was fully functioning, and yet in that state of samadhi while talking to people and running an ashram. Different state, yeah. yeah. So I think that's an important point, is that um, you know that which initially might require complete inward turning of the senses and inability to function eventually can get integrated and stabilized and lived in the midst in the midst of all functioning and that doesn't mean you're living in a sense of in a state of not having your senses functioning it means you're, you're they're functioning and, and yet that pure awareness which once required complete inward absorption is now stabilized in the midst of anything yeah and I was, I was listening to Adya last night, and he was uh, on a recording, and he was saying something about how there are degrees of situations which might test that. And he was referring to his his health problems and the severe pain it had caused him. And he, you know, so there's certain things that you can tolerate without losing your equanimity. But he said, it, even in his own experience, at times it went past a certain point, and you know, he was less established maybe than he. Yeah, would like to have been. To the great physical pain or, uh, I mean, it's not that, I don't believe awakened or liberated that you never have feelings either. People grief. Sure. Um, I remember when, when Baba Haridas at Mount Madonna Center, when one of his primary students, everybody thought would probably take his role eventually uh, died and uh, you know he felt it he talked about feeling it you know but what he said what he would say he didn't talk but he would write on his little chalkboard he said um, that you when you're awake and you don't it's not that you never have a hold on to it you don't carry it around yeah. it, it, it flows through you mm -hmm. And I, I thought that made a lot of sense. Also, you have more of a, a buffer. I mean, let's say you're a billionaire um, and you, you gain or lose $1,000. It's no big deal, you know, you're a billionaire. But let's say you, you're, you're homeless and you're living on the street, gaining or losing $1,000, even though it's the same amount of money, would be a huge deal. So, you know, this, this sort of pure awareness or whatever we want to call it is, is like a kind of a, inner affluence, um, which results in natural equanimity. It's a good way of putting yeah. it. Yeah. <clears throat> um, Okie dokie. So, um, there's a lot of practical advice in your book about, um, you know, sort of preparing for awakening, getting grounded, getting stabilized, you know, preparing the vessel. Um, and, uh, so maybe we could talk about that a little bit. Um, if someone has a, a deep 
yearning for enlightenment or awakening, they have a longing, um, what can they do to prepare for its dawning and to support it? Well, I think that, uh, of course, having a, a consistent meditation practice, mm -hmm. going into stillness, and meditation is a good place. Other schools of meditation, or if you have a center near you that does mindfulness or something like that, or TM or whatever, is having a consistent meditation in which you're sincerely uh, using it to uh, connect with your longing for truth. You're, it's a longing for truth. It started out for me as a god, but but everybody has a kind of a different longing or they're seeking, they're seeking inner peace or something of that sort. But I think that the longing for truth not caring what the truth is. I want to know what's true. And then just dropping it and going into deep stillness um, is helpful. Uh, something to open up your body a little bit better, like yoga or qigong, something that opens up those energy flows in the body is very helpful. If you've had a trauma, had any kind of a rough time as a child um, or a young adult, uh, if you've had psychotherapy, it's very helpful because yoga brings up everything and it's going to bring up um, meditation and yoga will eventually bring up issues that you are holding on to. So if you've learned how to look at that and hold it and work with it um, already, it's much easier to be familiar with the territory and you already have some skills. Uh, or coping with old memories or uh, distressing habits and things like that. It's good to be healthy, to take care of your body. Um, I think those are the, the basics. Those are the basics. I'm going to drink a little water. Sometimes I cough and I, I talk so Just much. as you said, it's important to be healthy, you coughed. <laughs> yeah. Got some kind of a throat blockage. Um, you said um, that what, the longing for God or to know if there's a God uh, was your one of your initial impetuses. What's the plural of impetus? Impeti? I don't know. In any, <laughs> in any case, uh, how did that go? I mean, how, how, what's your orientation to that question now? The, uh, back in the days when I was in that organization called Creative Initiative that I mentioned, mm -hmm. um, I psychological work. Uh, my mother died suddenly when I was 14. My family was Catholic mm -hmm. and to me, if God could do that, God was at the very best, if God existed, he was indifferent. That was how she was very devotional. And um, she had a brain hemorrhage that, uh, she, that she died. Mm -hmm. It was unexpected and in those days they didn't have the ability that they do today that she might have survived. So I was pretty shut down for 10 years. Um, and when we started to do personal work in this organization, I began to open up to the pain that I worked on and uh, began to see uh, that there was kind of a hole in me. I discovered it wasn't just the missing my mother, but it was missing God, because I had had a strong devotion as a young child. People said, well, I said, well, I, I don't know how to fix this. And people said, well, why don't you meditate? So that I had never been. And I uh, began to do all that serious meditation I mentioned earlier. Um, but it was really with that deep desire to know if there was a God. And um, I had a, a major during that time in, in which I just, it, the, the question went away. Mm -hmm. It wasn't as if God appeared. It was more like uh, some kind of an expansion happened that, um, that I it just, the question disappeared. I did, God was no longer some person out there that I was looking for. 
And I felt connected, I guess you could say. And I felt very blissful. It was very, very blissful. Um, very happy. And what happened is I was about uh, 28 or 30 at the time. And um, I was washing dishes one day. And I was feeling wonderful. And I thought, I'll never do anything wonderful washing dishes. <laughs> And so I decided to go back to graduate school and become a counselor. And uh, so during those years of going back to graduate school and taking on all of the all of that, starting my work in that field, um, I kind of had lost that deep connection. And and that's one of the reasons I went back to a graduate school that had a spiritual component because I wanted to reconnect. And by then my question was more, I just take me further let give me bring me to truth um so that was really the driving force in my own uh story <clears throat> would you um consider yourself a seeker now or do you feel like that whole seeking energy has dropped off just as the god question dropped off i don't have any interest in seeking but but i keep staying open to possibilities yeah. but I don't it's not an attachment it's like I'm happy where I am um, I I want to be of more use to people that I work with so I still stay as much as I can but but I'm not attached I uh, I just uh, want to stay open to what life wants to give me. Yeah. Do you still meditate or do some kind of spiritual practices? Off and on, not, uh, not with a consistency, not with, a, there's no drive, right. but that I'll feel like it and sit down and drop into that space. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I do song too, so I'm also. You do what? Oh, so you uh, you in Ashland yeah. here, so yeah. And, yeah, it's interesting. From from the out, I I, some, I had my fiftieth anniversary of learning to meditate um, this summer, and I've done it very regularly ever uh, ever since. And sometimes people, I, I actually got a little flack when I announced that on Facebook because some people said, "Geez, you know, fifty years, haven't you sort of gotten it by now? Um, you're still seeking after all these years, like Paul Simon, still crazy after all these years." But um, you know, it's, I don't relate to it that way. It's it's more like, like kind of like what you were just saying about an ongoing interest and fascination and exploration and adventure and and there's you know so much to learn and experience and it's no longer driven by the sort of empty craving feeling that you kind of may start out with. It's it's more like um, feeling a great deal of fullness and contentment and yet no diminishment of of enthusiasm and fascination with this whole this whole field. Agree. I, I feel like it's a. I think of it as like a marinating in the truth, marinating in the that deep stillness, uh, and and to be yeah. and uh, and uh, it's like going. Told me they were. They feel. It's, it's just going home. And, you know, I'm just doing a program right now on um, a three-month uh, meditation program that I'm participating in. And one of the things he says, if, you, if you've had an awakening, uh, don't just assume it's done and, you know, that's it. I don't need to do anymore. Keep sitting. Keep meditating because uh, unlimited potentiality that can arise. I don't know if that's the language he used, but that's my interpretation. Don't don't stop. Keep sitting. Uh, he recommends. And I, I think that's really true. I always tell the people that come to me with their issues, um, see what what's next, you know? Just yeah. let your it 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 helps you to um, embody it in that place more and more. And you can drift away from it if you never Take the time. Yeah, I, I'm. I don't. I'm no expert on the Buddha's life, but I'm told that he practiced some kind of meditation all of his life. You know, 
um, some hours a day, <coughs> and yet he was already liberated, and you know. In <coughs> you know, as if you're especially today, I think uh, we're living in a really intense world. You know, there's all the data being thrown at us all the time. Uh, most of it geared to make us frightened or worried. <laughs> There's crowds. There's traffic. Uh, you know, you you're not. We're not living in a environment for the most mm -hmm. part. Uh, and and I think meditation gives you a a center. It gives you a connection mm -hmm. so that you can move much more from the from the aura, from the from the uh, deepest point of connectedness um, in the world. Uh, and that it's very easy to get scared. There's always something on the television or the radio or the driver next to you that's that's wired, that's that's throwing negative energy your way. Um, it's very important for people in an awakening process. Usually, your sensitivity becomes very heightened, and it, sometimes it's really important stages uh, to avoid as much as you can toxic input, whether it be people that upset going to big box stores or watching too much television. Some people can't even read the newspaper today. Uh, because your sensitivity, all your senses are just huge, uh, at least for a while. Yeah, for a while. I mean, it depends on what what, what, you're, what you can handle. I, I went through a phase where I would just feel scatterbrained and drained if I went into a Walmart or something. Now it, now it doesn't bother me. And, yeah. Yeah. Usually. Um, but uh, it, it's just important to, I think the meditation gives you a home base, you know, it helps you grow that stillness inside of yourself and that makes it more and more tolerable to be in environments that are static. Yeah, I find it rejuvenating. I also find it interesting to challenge it in ways that aren't deleterious, such as, uh, you know, playing really intense sports or something like that, and just and and kind of finding the the juxtaposition of silence with that intensity is is just fine. You know, it, it, it's not not shaken by having pickleballs slammed at my head. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, the term spiritual emergence, you know, when I first heard that term, I, I thought it was sort of a play on the term emergency, because you hear about people having kind of emergencies with kundalini awakenings that they can't handle and so on. And I guess that's part of what Stan Groff was trying to help people with. Um, but I guess what, and you can tell me in a second if, if, that, if that sort of is a, if there's some synonymousness there, but... Um, but emergence really means some like a, a chick emerging from an egg. It means a sort of a, a or a plant emerging from the ground. It, it means sort of a blossoming forth. And I guess that's the sense in which that term is is used in that phrase. It's, it's you could say consciousness uh, emerging uh, something, and the energy is emerging. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a something new is emerging and changing the system. More uh, more often, it's uh, equated with. Uh, a uh, butterfly emerging oh, okay. from a cocoon. Yeah. There you go. That's why you have that on your book cover. Lots of little butterflies. <clears throat> um, do you often deal with people? I think I've referred some people to you who were having a, a real hard time. I mean, and what percentage of the people you, you talk with are having a difficult time coping with the Kundalini awakening that they're experiencing? Oh, gosh. Well, it depends on what you mean by a hard time. Yeah. So there's a huge range right. with some people. Most of the people I talk to, uh, once they have a context and uh, they begin to make friends with the energy, to make friends with what's happening to mm -hmm. them, get in it in a more neutral way and let go of their fear, um, then a lot of the issues... Stop. I mean, they still have difficulties figuring out what to do about, oh, their head is jerking a lot or their, um, you know, various things are happening. But once they develop a cooperative relationship 
with the inner I don't want to have this happening, stop it. Sometimes people go for a few days without sleeping and that's going to make them look very psychotic and those are the ones that often end up hospitalized. The ones that end up hospitalized are usually, uh, they've had the awakening on a psychedelic. They um, have gone, they've gotten very, very wired, excited. Maybe they were in India, uh, new and mature about it and uh, they didn't sleep for two or three days. Well, anybody who doesn't sleep it's going to look psychotic. Mm -hmm. It doesn't require Kundalini awakening, mm -hmm. but um, and or they have an experience. And there's this in my book. Um, one woman was a psychiatrist. She had a very dramatic experience with um, after an opening that occurred um, uh, during, I think, during labor or related to birthing a baby. And um, her husband hospitalized her because he was so alarmed mm -hmm. by it. Um, so she, you know, if that happens, it's hard because people have this little gnawing feeling, something's really seriously wrong with me. And they really, but gee, I had this ecstatic moment of total unity and, uh, you know, what does that mean? Yeah. Well, that kind of uh, relates to what I was saying earlier about the importance of knowledge and experience. If, you know, uh, without adequate knowledge of what's happening, your head starts shaking or something, you think you've got a neurological disorder, but if you, which you may, and you, you might need to get it checked out, but uh, there are all kinds of phenomena like that that happen with Kundalini awakenings that could be, t could be really disconcerting if, if you have no idea what it is, but which are just, you, you take it in stride with a shrug if you know that that's what it is. It's oh, okay, fine, uh, something good is happening, nothing, this is not dangerous, I'll just kind of Go with it. You know, uh, one of the things I've really tried to do with my book, and I'm not sure if it comes across, is uh, is show the general good health of most people who go into a spiritual awakening process. That uh, that most of the people I talk to have had successful lives at some level. They've either been, uh, you know, raised a family. Professionals in their field. Uh, I've talked to judges, uh, psychiatrists, teachers, professionals, IT professionals. They're people who are not people who have um, disorders or, or other kinds of problems before this happened to them. So to look at what's happening with a little bit of distance, it, it, instead of being totally immersed in it, the way that you might be if you're more tense. They're seeing these weird things and they're saying, what's going on here? I don't understand it. I don't, I don't care about my work anymore. Um, I'm uh, having all this energy. I can't sleep at night because my energy is revving up and running through me. Um, I'm, I'm scared because um, I had this, this vision. I don't know what it means. So they're trying to understand it. And they're not unhealthy people. But once they get a context to them and they can see some things they can do to kind of ground the energy or maybe they need to do less of some kind of practice they're doing. They need to get a new context because somebody's told them that they were crazy or that they were um, the devil was after them and they knew that couldn't be so. And so they don't have any context. Um, but once they get that, um, then they can work with it. And doing with people that I do assessments with is uh, doing webinars where I bring them to they they love it because many of them, I have people in Norway and Switzerland and uh, China, uh, Taiwan, and I mean, they're, they're all alone. They don't know a single person they can talk to about this. Uh, and if they do try to talk to people in their community, uh, the people at the very best don't understand what they're talking about. They may be supportive because, oh, I really care about you. I'm sorry you're going through this. I have no, no way of helping them get any kind of understanding. So they're so happy to meet other people and see that these other people look just as normal as you and I. They're just normal people. They're interesting people. Uh, 
then they start to feel more, okay, okay, well, all right, I guess this is something important I need to understand better that's happening to me. And, and maybe when I was meditating and uh, this was what I was, I didn't know yet, but this is the process. And so once they understand that, uh, things calm down greatly. Getting rid of fear is the most important thing anyone can do. Yeah. And, and then there's a lot of other things you can do you, to really trust the energy uh, itself, to accept and trust it, makes a huge difference. You can uh, activities to try to express some of that energy. That's very helpful. Uh, there's many things they can. If your body get some some energy practices that open you up more so once they get a handle on there's actually things i can do to get in a more cooperative relationship they, they feel a lot and hmm. so that doesn't really take very long um it's it's really just knowing yeah good oh, that's an interesting point i'm glad we keep coming back to that the the value of knowledge um it's really uh, there's that saying, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, you know. Um, and I think that the more one can understand this whole process without, you know, becoming obsessive about it, but the, um, the, the better served one will be. Um, but it's an interesting point you just made about most of the people who come to you are fairly accomplished people, professionals of some sort or something. It, it, you're kind of saying, I guess, that there seems to be a correlation between having one's act together, having one's life together, being a coherent, mature uh, person with a well-developed sense of per self or whatever, and having some kind of um, awakening. Is that what you're saying? Well, what I feel is any, anybody can have an awakening, but um, most of the ones who contact me are uh, it shows that they were pretty functional, very functional yeah. before. It, uh, an exception is young, 19 or 20 year right. olds. And they're usually, often it's because of a psychedelic that they've had this opening. And they haven't really yet developed their place in the world. You know, they're still in the other transitional phase of not how I'm going to be. And it's a lot harder in a way for some of them because. Um, then it, it's I don't I don't know I don't know how to quite explain it, but um, it's good. I, you know, you've probably seen that. Several of the Buddhist teachers have said that it's much better to have a good ego before you go yeah. through this process yeah. uh, than not to have it. If you're if you're uh, kind of borderline or, or uh, bipolar, an awakening. But it's much harder to figure out how to cope with it because your your way of functioning is more erratic. Um, and, and so it's, you know, you really need to take care of the underlying issues before you mature the awakening process. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a kind of a, a mix of learning, you know, how, what do I have to do to take care of myself? so that I can deepen my awakening and, and live with more deeper peace and presence in the world. Yeah, it's an interesting point. You, have, you take kind of a dim view of psychedelics, I, I think, in your book. At least that's the feeling I got as I was reading that section. Um, and yet, at the same, yet these days, there's a lot of interest in it. Um, people are microdosing, and there's popular books out. Michael Pollan, whom I hope to interview, has a book called changing your mind in which he compares the mind to a snow globe and he said you know at a certain point in your life it's good to just shake up the snow globe which is precisely why I, I would be very reticent to use anything like that because I feel like I'd be playing Russian roulette with my brain um, <laughs> I think there's been a certain amount of um, brain sculpting going on to use another popular term neuroplasticity all these years and why gamble with it but for some people it seems to really precipitate uh, an awakening and yet, as you say, um, you know, taking the, the 60s as an example, if, if people go about it in any kind of a, a reckless way, or if they're not mature and healthy, psychologically healthy, 
they can get into big trouble. And one more statement before I bounce it back to you, and, and yet, in spite of what I just said, psychedelics apparently they are being used to help people with suffering from PTSD and alcoholism and stuff like that. So there's some conflicting evidence in there, and, and I think, and since it's been illegal, it's been hard for adequate research to be, to be done, uh, but there's certainly growing interest in it these days. I think that it's quite possible to have very expansive experiences on psychedelics. Um, the difference is that it's, you don't have any, once you take it, once you use that substance, it's just going to do what of knowing what it's going to do. So if you're a very adventurous person and you're pretty stable, you know, uh, maybe it's not a problem, but uh, it, it's a totally unpredictable ride. So positive things and negative things about it. Uh, I've run into a number of people who, huge openings when they were young in the 60s, and um, one friend of mine, he... Um, on the beach babbling and totally out of control and was hospitalized and that whole experience stunned him so much that it was years before he was willing to go back to any kind of afraid of meditation and spiritual things afraid it would throw him into that same place yeah. and a number of people that have happened to um, you know Ram Dass is a case in point that he decided let go of the psychedelics and go to India and find some real teachers about this mm -hmm. stuff and that worked out well for him. It's a, it's really a crapshoot. Um, for some people, it's going to be helpful, and for others, it's not. And uh, there's a new uh, drug that seems to open up a part of the gospel pill. This one can go into very beautiful connectedness that uh, people are experimenting. I've Is that known DMT people or I've something? Known yeah, DMT. yeah, I've known people that have done that that are mature. That that it seems to last about fifteen minutes. <laughs> minutes. It's not like uh, four or five. Yeah. Lose the microphone. Um, and um, the people I know that have used it are very mature people, very experienced. It. They've appreciated the, the boost, but I don't know of. Generally, there, I, there's no research on that kind of thing right now, and and who knows yeah. whether it's an impact on the brain that's positive or negative. We won't ever know till we are able to research such that's things. That's the thing. I, I also wonder, although I'm in favor of marijuana being legalized because I think it's ridiculous that people are being, you know, put in jail for it, as I was a couple of times back in the '60s. Um, I, at the same time, I wonder what it's what the long term effect is going to be of, of its use. Um, I know what the long-term effect on me on, on, would have been had I been doing it all these years. I would be a very different person in a, in a bad way than I am now. Um, so, But who knows, maybe it'll be like it was for us, maybe it'll be a stepping stone for some people. Marijuana is particularly good for people who are in a spiritual process. Mm -hmm. I think the people, I've known a few who have had spiritual experiences while smoking marijuana, they meditate on it, uh, who became quite the quite distorted. Yeah. It, a little more a little more psychotic type mm. episodes. Uh, or the lack of discrimination. I, I cite one in my book, a man I met many years ago, who um, had been and uh, he would do practices looking at Muktananda's picture and an airplane and he decided he had to bless everybody so he's walking up and down the aisles blessing everybody and of course he wouldn't sit yeah. down and he had other tendencies like that that got him in a lot of trouble and it's like the brain I don't think the the brain is going through changes in long-term meditation it's slowly evolving and opening up new brain center throw in a substance that uh, creates images allows you to have kind of a hallucination. Mm -hmm. It's like stuff. You don't know what's real and what isn't. 
your discrimination isn't so good. So I, I can't speak from experience about marijuana because that isn't part of my history, but um, I've certainly talked to a lot of people that use it. And the summer attached, even though they're waking up, they, the other thing a yogi once told me is that it leaves toxins in the body, um, it stores in the fat cells. And one of the things the Kundalini is trying to do is release all your toxins. So if you're smoking pot regularly, you're going to have problems need to release energy. But then other people have told me it calms the energy down. So uh, it's it's kind of it'd be do interesting. It would be to do some really serious research yeah. in that area. I remember seeing some research that indicated that there's some kind of chemical gunk deposited in between in the synapses between neurons. You know, if people smoke a lot of pot. Um, but I don't know, it's, it's, this whole topic is somewhat a matter of opinion, although I think it's something that could be researched more. But um, I have friends in India who, who are of the opinion that 99% of those sadhus who sit around the Ganges smoking pot are just bums, you know, they're, they're just sort of, they're potheads. There's not, nothing, no real serious significance to their realization. Um, yeah. Though of a Christina Groff's book, uh -huh. the um, let's not say about the something, mm -hmm. and she talks about her own addictions and and how important it was for her to get off of alcohol and drugs uh, in order the, how much it messed up her, her spiritual process, her awakening process. Uh, I can't remember the full title of the book, but it was by Christina Groff, if, if any of your yeah. listeners are interested. Well, the body is the temple of the soul, and, uh, and it's the instrument through which anything is experienced and, uh, and through which awakening is, is experienced. And so, you know, I think what you and I have been talking about for two hours is there's an importance to cultivating or culturing the vehicle so it's better and better able to um, support this experience, which we're interested in. Um, and and uh, by experience, I mean, you know, a perpetu uh, an abiding state, not just some flash in the pan. And drugs tend to be flashes in the pan by definition. They, they, you go up, you come down. Um, and so it's just um, something to be approached if one's going to approach it at all with tremendous caution and respect and, um, you know, I, I don't know, I had this realization when I was 18 on LSD one time, <laughs> and it was the last time I ever took drugs, which is, you know, I, just, I was sitting there reading a Zen book, Zen Flesh, Zen Bones, three in the morning, and, you know, it just kind of struck me. I thought, wow, you know, these guys are really serious, and I'm just screwing around, and if, if, I, keep, if I keep on like this, I'm going to live a miserable life, and what's more, I'm stuck in this body, and if I damage this body, I'm going to be stuck in a damaged body. It wasn't as, I wouldn't have been able to articulate as clear, it as clearly at that point, but that was the essential realization. I thought, that's it. I'm going to stop taking drugs, learn to meditate, and see what happens. And I'm grateful that I did. Um, so I'm open-minded. I want to interview Michael Pollan and some other people on, on that topic. I've done so before, but I'm just very, very cautious and reticent on, on the topic because I've seen so yeah. much damage, you know, so many problems. Yeah. I agree. I I feel the same way. I'm not close to it, but I I think it can go in any direction, and and you're really taking a gamble. And if you're, a, it might be worthwhile for you, but if you you really want a functional, stable life with deep inner peace, if you're rather than drama, um, you might want to do meditation instead. Yeah. I think another thing is, you know, whatever drugs do um, to our brain chemistry um, to, enable to, to enable us to have certain experiences, I think research, most researchers would say we, we have the capability of, of producing those chemicals or those, those brain states without any substances. There are sort of subjective methodologies such as meditation and other spiritual practices which can elicit those things. And, but we'll only, but we'll do so in a more safe way when the time is right. You know, when you've actually built up the, low, the degree of purity or clarity that would naturally um, support such an experience. But like you said earlier, I mean, someone, young person, n no spiritual background or anything else, they can pop anything in their mouth and 
is that are they, you know, it might elicit all sorts of changes in the brain, but are they really prepared for that? All the deep conditionings and impressions and impurities and everything else that may be in the system, they're still going to be there. And you may, um, you know, stir up a, a hornet's nest if, if you just, um, you know, embark on such a thing without the kind of preparation that serious spiritual traditions usually advocate. It's a uh, slow transformative process with meditation or breath practices and yoga. It's a slow evolving and changing of the brain. Um, with a drug, it's sudden and, and you just have no predictability about what's going to get changed or how you're going to feel afterwards or uh, it's going to fall away is going to get added like these uh, visions and things that you that are going to be more of a nuisance yeah. than a uh, benefit. And also, I mean, how are you going to stabilize it? That was one of the complaints of Ramdas and others. Well, you always come down. And, um, you know, are you going to take LSD all your life in order to, uh, <laughs> in order to stabilize a state of realization? I don't think so. I don't think it's going to have that effect. So you kind of have to think long term. Uh, and, you know, what, what is really going to serve me over the course of my entire life. That's what I was, yep, mm. I agree. Well, I don't know if I, we want to end on, on this note. We've been talking about all kinds of things, and here we, now we've been talking about drugs for the last 10, 15 minutes. Is, it, is there anything, uh, you know, that we haven't talked about that you want to be sure to, to mention before we wrap it up? Well, I would say that in my book, I offer a lot of uh, solutions, sort of solutions, potential mm -hmm. for various phenomena that arise. Uh, but generally, uh, I just want to say that that there's certain cornerstones that really help us. Uh, meditation, uh, working directly, being friendly and curious instead of being afraid, uh, meeting and clearing up your old psychological stuff, um, trusting this is a process that wants to bring you to a new level. Um, inner peace, much more clarity. It's not out to harm you in any way. Um, using creative expression to express some of it. Take good care of your body and to be authentic. And those are kind of the cornerstones that I've been using really in looking at what does somebody really need. And if anybody listening is a therapist or a, a yoga teacher, meditation teacher, those are the things that people need uh, in order to a more uh, balanced and harmonious place with their energy. Yeah. So um, just want to make sure people know that mission life is to get that information out there. Those are pretty useful prescriptions for life, anybody's life, you know, spiritual aspirant or not. That's true. A question just came in um, from a listener in Austin, Texas. I might as well ask this. Um, she is Kate from Austin. Oh, I just said Austin. Um, she said, I had a drastic change of personality, much more open and relaxed. I would like to I, I would shake and lie still for hours in a night or day. Didn't need to speak for days at a time. Felt lovely. However, a lot of sexual energy, which was fairly alarming, and I still have. Uh, and I still have to swim. She's not using punctuation here. And I still have to swim a mile and do yoga once a day. What's all that bit about? Oh, well, the energy comes up from the base. Mm -hmm. It gets stuck in any of the chakra areas or it can overactivate any mm -hmm. of them. So sometimes it just gets stuck in the sexual area in the second chakra. And it can be very... Uh, sometimes when it's in the heart, really active, you can feel a difficulty with your heart, with your chest, beating too hard or, or trouble breathing. Some have these funny neck movements. Uh, what I usually tell people is there's a there's two possibilities learn the bij mantras bij mantras those are tones to 
activate each of the chakras and you can use them to move energy from one chakra to another. You can find people doing those a couple of places on the YouTube. There are classical yoga sounds for each chakra. Om is the one for familiar with Om. Um, there are Lam, Vam, Ram, Yam, Ham, Om. Those are all listed in my book. Uh, the other thing is on my website, my kundaliniguide.com website, there's a meditation for harmonizing chakras that I put on there that um, I felt would be useful to help people learn that through attention, you can move energy to different areas. So that coming relation in a relationship with your own energy it's your own life force it's your own energy but um you can get in you can learn to kind of when it's too much in one area bring it your area of the, the system um and so patient my website was designed for it some people have said it was helpful so i would suggest that um the other thing is if uh, this person is doing, they need to look at their life and see if they're doing anything that's overcharging them. It's good to be a detective. You know, like when I have too much sexual energy, what was I doing that day? Or when I have, I'm awake all night with too much energy. What did I eat? Where was, who was I talking to? Worried about something? What was going on? So that you can kind of learn to adjust your day to the, to the things that feel more balanced and harmonious. Uh, and you can recognize in a way that for, because think of the energy, it's stress from your body. It's trying to release everything. It's trying to make you very, very open. So the more you've got in there that's stressful or anxious or you're preoccupied with something, the more it's going to need to work that out. And it usually chooses it to do that. So... That's that's what comes to mind anyway, right off the top. I do usually I do consultations uh, where I send people a questionnaire so that I can get background information. I the guidance I offer if I know someone's history. I'm always looking for correlations between certain behaviors or beliefs or history and the kind of phenomena that they're struggling. With. So Kate could get in touch with you. So that that's kind of yeah. Yeah, they can sites is based there's a contact on uh, kundaliniguide.com or awakeningguide.com uh, and then I'll send them the questionnaire and other information yeah. about the assessment. I'll link. That's the best way. I'll link to those things from your page on Batgap. Um, also I think it sounds good that she swims a mile a day and does yoga. That's that's great. I'm a big advocate of physical activity. A lot of times spiritual types sit around their butts too much and don't in fact i was just talking to a friend the other day here in, in fairfield uh, where you know thousands of people have been meditating for years and he he saw a bunch of people recently that he hadn't seen in a long time he was shocked at how old they looked and he ha he happens to be a tennis instructor and i see him up at the gym all the time because i go up there and we, we both thought that you know the problem is is inactivity these people sit around too much their diet might be inadequate you know and uh, they don't get enough sun and and, and you know it ages you so it's again coming back to this theme of the, the body is the vehicle you have to take care of it and balance in all things I agree so it's very good to do something physical to to keep in uh, your body healthy and as open as possible yeah. okay great well um, I guess that's a pretty good wrap-up point thank you Kate for that question that enabled us to sort of end it on that interesting practical note mm -hmm. and um, uh, I presume those who are have been listening understand that you know you can get in touch with Bonnie if, if you feel that what she has to offer might be useful to you and I think just about everybody at some stage of their spiritual practice might find it useful <clears throat> um, but in any case there are her books and I have read two of them now one for each of the interviews I've done and I'll be listing them all on <clears throat> batgap.com, linking to them, um, so people can check them out if they like. I found them very... In fact, this one, there's this guy named uh, Rick Archer who said, uh, you'll find this one of the more useful and memorable spiritual books you've ever read. <laughs> That's my, my little blurb on the back. <laughs> I was. I, I like practical advice, and I like people who... I like it when people have a 
kind of a they don't have a one size fits all attitude. They realize that <clears throat> there's so many varieties <clears throat> to spiritual experience, and and everybody's just not going to fit into the same mold. And and you know different people are going to need different bits of advice or practices or remedies or or what or therapies or whatever in order to deal with whatever they're going through. I think that's, that's kind of a realistic. It's the, it's the reality of the situation. Great. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, let me just make a wrap-up point or two. Um, you've been listening to uh, an interview with Bonnie Greenwell, and um, this is my second interview with her. And if you enjoyed this one, you might want to go back and listen to the first one as well. I'll link to that from, I'll link, I'll interlink them on on Bat Yep, and. Um, Obviously, I continue to do these. If you would like to be notified of new ones, go to batgap.com and sign up for it to be notified by email, or you could subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, it also exists as an audio podcast for those who like to listen while driving and stuff. Um, next week, I'm going to the SAND conference. Are you going there, Bonnie? No, I won't be there this okay. year. Okay, well, I'm going out, and I'll be doing a bunch of interviews there and panel discussion and whatnot, and I'll be putting them all up on that gap. So there'll be the usual post-sand flood of, of material uh, when I get back. Um, so thanks a lot for listening or watching, and we'll see you for the next one. Thanks, Bonnie. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Yeah.